I have some additional thoughts about the M3 MacBook Pro and also iMac, so let's talk about it. This is Artist Right. Before we start, subscribe if you're new and hit on the bell icon so you'll be notified every time I upload cool new videos like this. Thank you to those of you who have already subscribed. If you haven't, please consider subscribing and hitting on the bell. This way, when I release those photocentric benchmark, you'll see them right away. If you find information that I'm sharing helpful, please consider supporting the channel. I'll leave a link to my tip jar, or you can use YouTube Super Thanks as well. All the funding will go into directly running this channel. So I'd like to share with you a comment that I received, which I find rather interesting. Now, I'm not sure if this is a compliment or not, but I am going to take it as such. A few things I want to say, though, is that the table is a comfortable height for me, these computers are pretty much the latest and greatest technology. They're definitely not VGA. And anyone who's watching my channel, all of you who are watching my channel right now, you guys are intelligent people and you want to make the best decision and choose the right machine for your workflow. That's why you're watching this. And this is for audience of all ages. So, and I know that because I look at statistical data on this. All right. That being said, moving on. So, there's a couple of comments about the M3 generation that I want to address quickly. I don't work for Apple or anything like that. I just, you know, really just look at this from a technology standpoint. That Apple have kind of just ruined Apple Silicon with M3 generation because, you know, there are some memory bandwidth changes. There are some core reduction from the previous generation, but I think they were making improvement in other areas that are going to compensate for that. So until we get the machine into the studio, I would rather hold my judgment and not really look at it that way. Now, the Geekbench results are starting to show up online already, and it's kind of all over the place, depending on the interpretation and who's interpreting them. Because some would say like it's good, some would say it's an improvement, some would say it's barely an improvement, but I mean, it really depends on who's really looking at the data, right? Because 10 or 15%, do you consider that a huge improvement or a barely improvement kind of thing? It really just depends. So, and the other thing I also want to mention too is that when it comes to these silicon and technology, this is now following the cadence of anything that have come before it. Yes, it's going to get faster, it's going to get more efficient, but you're not going to get the double or triple performance like when Apple jumped from the Intel to Apple Silicon right away. That is a platform change and you generally don't get that unless there is another platform change that happens. So if we connect the dot looking backward, we're going to see an upward trend in the performance of these machines. So that's just something to think about. Now, many have asked me like, should I choose this one or should I choose the other machine? Whether one is going to be faster than the other? The answer is, I don't know. I don't have the machine in the studio. I'm not part of Apple pre-release crew or anything like that. So I don't get to see any of these machines before. I get to see when the machine goes into the hand of a consumer and that's when I really start testing. So I'm gonna hold off on making any type of recommendation or advice until I get those machines to test in the studio because then we'll have the data to back up what I'm really saying and that's important. Now, some of you are concerned about memory bandwidth and I have already done a memory bandwidth with tests on the M1 generation. So that is the M1 Pro that has 200 gigabytes per second versus the M1 Max that has 400 gigabytes per second bandwidth. So double the bandwidth and you're going to see in the video that I'll link in the description that it doesn't really have any variation whatsoever in terms of the app. And even though those are not apps that are the current generation based on that OS and the current apps right now, I mean, if you're not really seeing it there, you're not going to see it in the current iteration either because a couple of things that I found in my testing is that, well, and also another thing too is I retested all the machines that I have in the archive. So some may be missing, but I retested most of the machines so that we have a fresh new result with a new OS. A couple of things I also found out is that depending on the application, some of them are showing improvement, but not on all the machines. Some of them are really not showing an improvement. And in fact, it takes a little bit longer to finish the task on the same group of files. And this is on a modern operating system on the latest set of app from the developers. So I'll share with you more information when we do the full comparison then, but that video is still going to be valid. So I would not even look at the memory bandwidth and be concerned about it because I also said in my previous video as well as that most of the apps that we use right now are not even anywhere near close to saturating that memory bandwidth. All right, a couple of things that I missed last time or didn't mention was that the 14 inch MacBook Pro with the M3 chip has one less Thunderbolt port. So if we take a look on the screen right now, this is the M3 one. You can see that you have the Thunderbolt USB 4 on one side of the machine, but on the other side, you only have the SD card and HDMI, whereas 
on the Pro and the Max, you have that extra Thunderbolt port. So if you're looking for extra port, you have to go for the Pro in that one. That's just something to note there. And a lot of this has to do with just the limitation of the ship inside the machine as well, in terms of how many ports Apple is really going to assign. And granted, yes, they could probably put in USB 3, but it would probably be more confusing. So they decided not to do that and also making the laptop cleaner. But here's the thing. I, like I said before in the previous video as well, is that them moving the M3 platform into the 14 inch does gain a lot of benefit. For example, you still get the XDR display, the MagSafe 3 charger that frees up the two Thunderbolt ports on the machine. You get the HDMI and SD card reader. So those are all great things. Now, another thing too about the difference between the M3 and versus the M3 Pro and M3 Max is that the Pro and the Max will come in space black because that is the brand new color for the top Pro machine or the higher tier Pro machine. And you still get the space black in the 14 inch M3. If that is something that matters to you, just something to consider. The thing that I will say is this. Apple understands their user base and they're creating all these tiers so that everyone can buy in at the level that they are comfortable. But I do have a few thoughts on this. So what I am going to do is I'm going to choose the 14 inch M3 and this is going to be pretty much the base configuration with 512 gigabyte SSD. We're going to start with that. And I'm also going to choose the M3 Pro, which is also a stock base configuration. And we're going to do a couple of things. So. I'm going to do some memory upgrade on this and give you some food for thought even before I get the machine in. But a couple of things I want to share with you regarding my testing as well is that when it comes to just the regular M3 ship, I'm going to be testing machines that are custom built to order with 16 gigabytes of memory. Part of the reason why is because I have two machines on my table that is part of the M1 and M2 generation. This is a 13 inch MacBook Pro to have 16 gigabytes of memory on the machine. So we get a chance to really see how they really scale with the same amount of memory. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to twist test the 24 gigabytes of memory because we already know how the memory is going to affect certain tasks. And I'll annotate that when I'm doing my benchmark videos and share that with you. So that's a couple of thoughts about that one. The other thing I want to share is that when it comes to the Pro and the Max, for the most part, I'll be testing stock configuration with some very rare exception that I would do a custom build to order one. So I just want to share that information with us. So anyway, back to this comparison quickly, the 14 inch MacBook Pro with the M3. Now, if we go in and bump this to 16 gigabytes of memory, we are now within a stone throw of the 14 inch MacBook Pro with the M3 Pro ship. You can see that we're about 200 apart. And if you upgrade this to 24 gigabytes of memory, now you're pretty much looking at the price that are about the same. Now you will say that yes, you do get more RAM on this, but you don't necessarily get, uh, for instance, the extra core that you have the extra Thunderbolt port on these machines. Personally, if I am looking at this with a 24 gigabyte machine versus a M3 Pro, I would probably go for the M3 Pro just because you do get the more core counts. And in general, the more core counts, it's not just the core counts alone. It actually is more performance core. So you're going from, for instance, the left, which just the M3 to the M3 Pro, the performance go cores goes from four to five, the efficiency go from four to six. And because of the improvement in this core, we're probably going to see a little bit more of a difference between them. And a the total of it goes from eight to 11 cores. So I'm hoping that these would really come out to a fairly substantial variation in terms of the way how machine perform, which I think it would be. The GPU, you got 10 to 14. Like I said, two more gigabytes of RAM to 18 gigabytes on this one. Something very interesting happening there. And those are just kind of the things to really think about when it comes to all these uh, factors. So like I said, RAM effect is known. I'm going to annotate that. But for the most part, when it comes to M3, we'll just be testing 16 gigabytes. The next thought that I have is regarding iMac. Now I haven't talked about the iMacs much and I haven't really thinking about this. I think that for this cycle, I'm not going to test any iMac. Most likely that is not going to happen. So if you want to see how the iMac would perform, I would say look at the result for the 14 inch MacBook Pro with the M3 ship. And that's going to give you a really great idea because in previous generation, for example, especially in the M1, because iMac only existed in M1, it performs pretty much exactly the same as a 13 inch MacBook Pro. Really close to each other, really close to a Mac Mini. So we're just going to extrapolate the result from there. A couple of thoughts about the iMac regarding the machine that you might want to build. 
is as follows. So there is a base configuration as you see there. Now the base configuration does lack a few things. It doesn't have two extra USB 3 port. It doesn't have gigabit ethernet and two less GPU core. And also the keyboard, I don't believe it's touch ID enable as well. It's just a regular magic keyboard. So we're gonna click on that and we're gonna take a look at this one. So the first thing I'm going to say is that when it comes to these two machines, looking at the configuration, I highly recommend that if you're gonna configure this for a semi-pro workflow, look at getting the mid-tier one with the two extra GPU core. Not that you're gonna see that much of a difference because we've seen that bumping the GPU core up by two or three doesn't really create that much of a variation in daily workflow at all. But what you do get is more port real estate, which is absolutely crucial for any type of semi or pro workflow for that matter. And I'm also gonna go out and say one more thing is that these machines are not necessarily what I would consider pro machines for a couple reasons. Number one, for instance, if we go into this configuration and we bump this up to 16 gigabytes of memory, the 1699 price tag is already teetering on the Mac Mini M2 Pro price territory. And I think that that machine, it's going to even give you a much better performance. Now, how much better? Well, we're going to really see how the M3 generation performs compared to the previous generation Pro and Max SoC when the machine does come out and I get a chance to do a benchmark. Now, the other thing I also wanna point out is that on the base one, you can go in and add gigabit ethernet for $30, but again, you don't get the USB port and everything. So I would probably recommend going with the mid-tier iMac if that is something that you're considering. Now, some have been asking me, how is the 4.5K display going to work for photography. I think it's going to work just fine, especially if you have been editing on Macs before and you're perfectly fine with it. A couple of thoughts about that display is that the 4.5K is there in the 24-inch chassis because that really allows Apple to exceed the 200 pixels per inch, which is what they consider retina display, where you can't really discern the pixel apart. And that's the reason why they do that. The other thing that I also want to mention is that you're going to get P3 color gamut in these display, or I believe they're P3 anyway. But like I said, I'm most likely not going to get these into the studio to do some testing. And I would say, if, like I said, if you're looking at the mid-tier one, you're starting to look at the Mac Mini M2 Pro territory price tag. And if you have a good external display, that will probably end up being a better option for you. But we'll see, like I said, when we test the machine. Uh, a couple of other extra thoughts, we're almost more than halfway through the video already, is that regarding the number of display out, this is something that we you know, definitely don't want to forget, especially if we want to link up the machine to more displays. So because this generation machines that Apple have released this round, are either the iMac or the MacBook Pro, meaning that they already have one built-in display. Pretty much, here's the thing. If you just go with the regular M3 SoC, and this is the same with the M2 and M1 as well, you can only link out one external display to the system. That ship itself will support two, but the internal display counts as one in the system. Now, if you have a laptop, what you may say is that I can close the laptop and make this into a clamshell and I can probably link it under display, display to the system. And the answer to that is no. Whether you have this display built into the laptop on or off, it counts as one display out of the total that the system can handle. So on the M3, you can link up to just only one external display. On the M3 Pro, you can do two external and this whole ship itself can support three total. On the M3 Max, it has support for five totals, but you can really only do four external. And very similarly to the other ones that I've talked about, whether you have the laptop in clamshell mode or not, that does not really minus from the count of the total display in the system. So if you have an Apple device with a built-in display, the number one display is already counted into the system. So you have to minus that out. This is the reason why when it comes to, for example, the Mac Studio, M2 Max, it can link up to five display in the system. And that's the reason why, because there's no one display that's built into the system already. So that's part of the reason why to do that. Now, this is pretty much assuming that you're going to link display to our 4K60. If you have displays that are 5K or 6K or an 8K resolution or a higher refresh rate display, the numbers that you can really link them to does also go down as well. The good thing about this is that with the M3 generation, all the HDMI ports so far that we are seeing can support high refresh rate output now that can go up to 240 hertz. So that's really a good thing to see. So we'll see how this is all going to really plan out. 
Now, the other thing I want to really cover, and I hear a lot of people talking about this, including one of my friends as well that we've been talking a lot about, Kevin, and he asked me like, hey, you know, I've been hearing a lot about this like BIN SOC. What is that? So here's the thing. To give us a super brief history, all chips are pretty much bin. And what it really comes down to is that these are a short term from the previous days of bin sorted. And I think they're still doing the same thing nowadays as well is that when you fabricate a ship, not all the cores are going to work. So a lot of them are going to be firmware cap at the foundry when they're making the chip once they're done and they have it all cut, they put it into a machine to run a test to see which cores are good, which cores are not. And if you know, there are more bad cores, it gets bin into, you know, a lower tier. And the one thing though, is that there's some connotation that comes with binning the ship, meaning that people think that, oh, if I, for instance, let's just go in and open up a new tab here and go in and configure for instance. So we're gonna look at the 16 inch MacBook Pro M3 Max, and you have two configurations there. So some, have a tendency to think that if I choose, for example, the 16 core CPU one, the 40 core GPU, the top of the line one, that that's not been at all. And the reality of it is, think about this for just a second. If Apple knows, or any ship wrap knows for, for that matter, that they need 40 cores GPU, they're not going to fabricate just 40 GPU cores on the system. They're going to fabricate more because there are always a yield and a margin of error when they actually release this ship out when it comes out of the fab. And it's never just perfect that you're always going to get 100% yield that are come out at 40 cores. So technically, when you take a look at this, all ships are pretty much firmware cap in some way or the other on some cores from the factory. So just because you order this top one, it's not necessarily that it's unbin. It's also been bin sorted as well. Well, but it's been bin sorted to the highest tier bin. It doesn't mean that it is necessarily better. And it doesn't mean that if you go for one that is just a step down, that is considered the bin chip, that is going to be any worse. I mean, there may be some performance variation, but as far as how much, well, we're going to find out in those testing as well. So just a couple of thoughts about that so that we don't really misunderstand this concept too much. And I wouldn't necessarily put any much stigma around the fact that one is not bin because again, like they, they are all really firmware cap on the ship itself. All right. So like I said before, in the testing so far, some of the apps are really showing some performance improvement, but not across the board. That would be Capture One. The render preview is faster now, but not on all the machines, which is rather interesting. And on these newer operating system, this is Sonoma 14.1 and the latest version of Adobe Creative Suite, particularly for Lightroom. I've been noticing that the times takes a little bit longer for things to export, but we're going to find out those we saw when I really share with you the full comparison once I have at least one M3 machine into the studio to really do some testing. So. Stay tuned to find out more about that. If you have any questions or comment, leave them below. Give this a like, subscribe, and hit the bell if you're new. And you're not to trust. <laughs>